I don't have Eric's powerful voice. Thank you, thank you. I am Chuck Farmer. I'm with the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety. And uh, for those of you that do not know us, we are a research and educational organization dedicated to uh, doing anything that improves highway safety, reduces the number of crashes, and reduces severity of crashes. We have uh, insurance in our name for one reason, because that's where we get our funding. The, uh, the auto insurers fund us because it's to their advantage to also see a reduction of crashes. Um, but other than that, we're pretty independent. We decide what research to do, and uh, we go out and do it. We have uh, two offices, both in Virginia. Um, the headquarters, official headquarters, is just outside of Washington, D.C., in Arlington County. Second office is probably what we're more famous for, is uh, it's where we do our, our crash tests that we use to formulate ratings of new cars. Um, I don't do that. Although I, I work at that office, I uh, do not crash cars. I mostly spend my time looking at driver behavior and how to improve driver behavior. The right slide here. Um, speaking of driver behavior, it is the major factor in more than 90% of crashes. And, and that's been true for years. Speeding is, uh, is one of those behaviors that, uh, that we'd like to change. And uh, there are over 10,000 deaths per year in crashes. Better right here. That are related to speeding. You got another one? Just an extra one? Got it. I get too much. Too much. Um, speeding is is a problem. Um, it can make crashes more likely. It can make crashes more severe. And, and talk about physics here, but uh, I think we all understand the basic physics that the faster you're going, when you hit something, the more it's going to hurt. And, uh, we usually do. I'll run this again. In a minute. We usually do our crash test at 40 miles an hour, which doesn't seem like much, but this particular illustration is uh, the difference between a 20 mile, 20 mile per hour crash test and a 40 mile per hour crash test. And, uh, even though 40 doesn't seem like much, that vehicle, that CRV, is, is actually going up into the air after uh, hitting the wall in a 40 mile an hour crash. Speed is a problem. Speed in is a problem. I mentioned already that uh, there are over 10,000 deaths per year related to speeding. That's not a new problem. That's been going on for years. This, this graph went back to 95, but we go back further. And you see the same thing that at least 25% of the deaths each year have speeding as a factor. And uh, it makes it make sense to uh, try to change that behavior, trying to get people to stop speeding. We already do that with traditional enforcement. Various ways that we're trying to cut down on speeding drivers. Um, today I want to talk about automated speed enforcement, speed cameras. Why do we want speed cameras? Just to add to our, our tools and uh, changing our behavior. Police can't be out there all the time. The camera can be out there all the time. You have a fixed camera. Uh, doesn't take as many resources as putting police out there. Uh, often what you see is when you have targeted enforcement using Police patrols will see a temporary effect, a temporary reduction in speeding. 
And once drivers realize that the police are not there anymore, they have to go back to speeding. Cameras can stay out there indefinitely. <coughs> uh, speed cameras have been used around the world for quite a while now, at least 20 years. Uh, they're somewhat new in the U.S., although, again, they've been here a while. It's just taking time to get it accepted in communities throughout the U.S. So, uh, as of our latest count, there are about 140 communities in the U.S. that are using speed cameras. That's, that's up a lot from, say, 2007, I think, is the earliest time they arrived. But uh, we haven't seen much growth in the last few years. Um, states that allow the use of speed cameras. There are 14, I believe, plus in the District of Columbia, that allow speed cameras in their cities. And uh, there was a review done, it's been a while now, 2010, of uh, all the speed camera studies that have been done to that point. There were 35 of them. All around the world, a lot of them were Australia, Great Britain, uh, European countries, a few of us. And uh, in total, they found that uh, you can reduce speeding by behavior by 50% or up to 50% and reduce crashes by up to 50%. And those are mostly international studies. There hasn't been a lot done in the US. So, what I want to spend some time on now is. <coughs> studies that we have done, that I personally have worked on, of speeding camera programs in the U.S. First one we did was in Washington, D.C. And uh, they started their program in 2001 with uh, five cameras that uh, were in mobile units and just circulated throughout the city. Washington. The uh, way they set up the program was the, the uh, citation is, is basically like a parking ticket. You just ticket the owner of the vehicle and there's no points on your license. It's just uh, what is it, a $40 fine, $30 fine at the time. It's, it's gone up since that program has progressed quite a bit. But, uh, what we did was uh, we looked at seven sites in uh, Washington, D.C., spread through the, the uh, around the city in the seven police districts, basically, um, and uh, compared speeds before they started the program and speeds six months after they started the program, and also looked at Baltimore as a comparison city. Baltimore now has speed cameras, but at that time they didn't. And uh, wanted to see, is there a, a trend, or was there a trend in DC that was different from the trend in Baltimore? And mean speeds went down three or four miles an hour in uh, DC. At the same time, mean speeds went up about one mile an hour in Baltimore. We did see an effect of that camera program. And I should mention that these sites where we were uh, taking speed measurements, they actually never had any enforcement at those sites. They, uh, they were on the five cameras, and so they were taking care of the whole city. They never actually hit any of our sites. But still, we saw a reduction in speeds. And the more important measure to us is speeders, those that are going more than 10 miles an hour with a speed limit. And these are either 30 or 35 mile an hour roads in DC. There are not high speed roads there. And so you're going like 45, maybe 50 miles an hour on those residential streets. And we saw a huge reduction in speeders in DC, while at the same time in Baltimore, we saw an increase in speeders. And so by comparing 
the change in DC to the change in Baltimore. You see uh, what's that, about a 16% decline in mean speeds associated with the Kevin program, and more like an 80% decline in speeders associated with the Kevin program. So, so we cut down on mean speed, but the more important thing is we really cut down on those speeders in DC. This is within the first six months of that program. This was way back in 2001, 2002. Now, uh, I don't know how many cameras there are in DC. They've, uh, they've got fixed cameras in a number of locations. They've uh, still got the roving mobile cameras. They've expanded their program to uh, having cameras uh, monitoring stop signs. Monitoring uh, whether or not people yield to pedestrians. Uh, we haven't done an evaluation on that yet. We're hoping to, but uh, their program has grown quite a bit. So, do you see our first evaluation of speed cameras? Success, big, huge success. Next one we looked at was uh, Scottsdale, Arizona, which put in their program, what's that say, 2006. And uh, theirs was a little different. They started off with a pilot program. They just wanted to go for, uh, how many months is that, nine months? Just to see how it would work. And uh, the other difference, well, two other differences, is one, it's on 65 mile an road. There's this, this loop that goes around the Scottsdale area, and it's all 65 miles an hour. This is the first time we've seen speed cameras in the U.S. anyway on high speed roads. And the other thing that's different about Scottsdale is that they, you know, they do target the driver. They do make sure that their camera takes a picture of the driver so that they can give a citation to that driver and not only charge them uh, a huge amount of money actually, but uh, to give them points on their license to really discourage people from speeding on that, that section where they were highly spending. This is kind of what it looks like. Um, it's Arizona, so it's very flat. Um, not a lot around, even though it's just outside of Scottsdale. And uh, that's what the camera looks like. There were, there were uh, I think now, five, three or four or five fixed cameras. Over this very limited section, it was an eight mile section that they were doing the pilot study on. So, this very limited area in which they had done this And then they made sure everybody knows where that had been. <laughs> this picture, um, the reason it's in there, I said that they, they take pictures of the drivers so they can identify them and know who to, who to send the citation to. But part of the rule is you have to be able to identify the driver. And everybody knows that. So here's a guy, um, about 100 some miles an hour in this 65 mile an hour zone. And, uh, and he's aware enough to uh, put the hand up there and kind of block his face. So, so they can identify him. This is how we did the evaluation. Scottsdale. Um, that yellow section over there is, is the, the eight mile section where they're doing the enforcement when they got the cameras. Uh, we chose four sites all downstream of the cameras uh, just in case people would pass the cameras and speed up again. Then we also looked at four sites on that same roadway, that same Loop 101, but uh, over in Glendale. Is, uh, quite a ways away, but it's, it's in the same area, and it was the reason for that was to uh, see if people just got confused and thought that all of the 101 would be enforced. So maybe there's someone down there as well. And then we looked at a couple more sites at uh, this, this alternate roadway, this uh, other way of getting around Scottsdale, which is also. 65 mile an hour road, and it's clear to everybody that that was not being photo enforced. So that's the blue line there. 
if you wanted to avoid the unfortunate area, you could. And you still don't have to speak. And as we did in, in Washington, we uh, looked at what's going on with speeds before the program started, during the program started. And uh, this one, because the end of the program in October, we could actually look at what happened after the program ended. In these three locations that we were interested in. So in the, in the Scottsdale area, where they were doing the enforcement, we did see a reduction in mean speeds during the time that they were doing enforcement. And then it back up after the end of the program. And again, everybody knows just how long the program lasts, but it's in the media. There's a lot of uh, publicity about this. So they seem to know when it ended, they can debunk their speech on our way. In Glendale, um, somewhat surprisingly, but uh, again, it's the reason we looked at it, we did see a slight reduction during the period of enforcement in Scottsdale. And then uh, we go back up again once that pilot program ended. And on that ultimate highway, um, you can see any change at all. Speeds stay the same in all three periods before the first finish, during the pilot program, and after the pilot program is over. Percent going more than 10 miles an hour over the speed limit, which would be 75 in, in this case. Huge drop in Scottsdale. It's from what, 15% down to, uh, I think that's only 2% of uh, people that are still speeding during this, this uh, pilot program. And then once it's over, that's a time up again. In Glendale, same pattern, not as extreme. There's only some people that are confused about Glendale. Some people don't really know where the cameras are and, and when you have to be and when you don't have to be And then on that, uh, that alternate route, nothing changed really. They just stayed the same. And they were speeding, they were not speeding. Maybe there was no special camera enforcement. Regular enforcement is not the case. So there was no change on that road. And uh, again, the comparison of uh, Scottsdale to the uh, control sites, the ultimate road, you see not an 80% or more than 80% reduction in speed. Glendale sites, we see almost that much as well. All along the route or loop 101, we're seeing reductions in speed during the time of the program. All right, so the same thing in DC with residential streets, and then Scottsdale with uh, the highway. Next one we looked at was uh, Montgomery County, Maryland. Which is mentioning that you got to be careful there. And, uh, yeah, you have to be careful there. The program started in uh, 2007, that's it. And uh, it's grown around in many years, but originally it was just some uh, mobile units that uh, were roaming around the county. And they treated it the same way DC was treating it as a civil citation. Take a picture of the license plate, and then you you uh, cite the owner of the vehicle. But uh, Maryland uh, has made some changes, and the Montgomery County has made some changes over the years that uh, we were also able to evaluate by looking at this more long term. Uh, in 2009, the state legislature started. Loosening the rules on uh, who is being counted as a speeder. It was originally 11 miles an hour over the speed limit or higher. They switched it to 12. Um, I'm not exactly sure why, why, I mean, why, why it makes such a big difference, but uh, I guess it sounds like somebody that they switched it to a 12 mile an hour cushion instead of 11 mile an hour cushion. And, uh, and they also uh, cut down on 
the times that you can do enforcement in a school zones. Basically, the time when schools are being used is when you can do enforcement in school zones. Hopefully, I didn't think it's too much, but uh, it's a little bit of a change around the evaluation. And then there was a change that the Montgomery County Police put in in 2012, where uh, instead of keeping these cameras pretty much on the same roads every day, they would move them around in these traffic corridors so they could uh, also get the speakers that are taken off the roads. So here's uh, sort of a graph of the Montgomery County. It's just outside of DC. It's just across the line. And uh, we've got the Potomac River running down there in the middle, the blue thing. And so what we did was we chose a number of sites, uh, 19 sites in Montgomery County and spread throughout the county, and looked at speeds of vehicles before the program started. And then six months after the program started. And then we went back seven years later and looked at speeds seven years later. The program is still in fact a good grown. So we also looked at uh, come up as, um, some other sites in Montgomery County that were not subject to enforcement. In Montgomery County, the rule was you could enforce on um, any residential road that was 35 miles an hour or less. Um, we decided to see if there was a similar uh, misunderstanding as we saw with the red down folks that, that maybe applied to other roads. So we looked at some 40 mile an hour roads to see if speeds changed on there. And then we compared to uh, similar roads across the river in Virginia, in Fairfax and in Arlington counties. It's a nice set up to the other studies. We've got our control group and then we've got our, our group inside the county that's uh, subject to enforcement. Um, this is a typical site um, where we attach our cameras and then Usually downstream from where the fixed camera is, or if it's a mobile camera, this is one of the areas where they, where they do their uh, enforcement. And here's the, uh, the results. The, uh, the mean speeds started out uh, at around 40 miles an hour, went down to near 36 in Montgomery County. In Fairfax County, the speeds actually went down as well. This was, uh, you think of time period, it was 2007, 2008. It was during the recession, so speeds were going down in general. Um, pretty much all over the country. Traffic was going down in general as well. Um, but the, the decline was, was greater in Montgomery County compared to the Virginia counties. When we look at speeders, again, we see a big difference. Uh, in Montgomery County, we had almost 30% of people speeding before the program began. And uh, by the uh, end of the seven year period that we're looking at, uh, down around 10%. Whereas in the Virginia counties, there was a reduction, but uh, it wasn't as great as what we saw in Montgomery County. Now, let's move on the slide here. <clears throat> I, uh, I should mention what we saw in the six month period when we went back very early on in the, uh, in the program. The results were almost exactly the same as we saw in Scottsdale and uh, District of Columbia, that we saw about an 80% reduction in speeders in that initial six month period of the program. So, so things have calmed down a bit, not so much anymore. You know, we get a comparison of contact, not actually it is still about 80%. Um, but we saw that immediately and it has, it has lasted over the years that this program has been there. We're still seeing 
that's reduction in its features. They have not figured out how to beat it as yet. One of the nice thing about uh, doing this long-term study in the Montgomery County is that now we have enough data to look at crashes. Um, we couldn't do that with these six months before, six months after studies, especially in small places like, like DC, where uh, there are not a lot of crashes to begin with compared to bigger locations. Uh, so we looked at crashes in Montgomery County. <coughs> And we uh, looked over a 10-year period, so starting a few years before, <coughs> before the program began, going up through 2013, which uh, did a study a couple years ago, that's basically we had at the time. And we looked at uh, what proportion of these, these crashes involved serious injuries. And how did that change over time in Montgomery County and over in Fairfax County in Virginia as it regards? And uh, again, we mentioned before that there were a couple of changes made to, to the law in Maryland and in Montgomery County over time. The 2009 law already loosened the uh, rules for is it that's the called speeder from 11 miles an hour over the limit to 12 miles an hour over the limit. And then in 2012, I went to this traffic corridor approach on enforcement. And we were able to look at the individual effects of those changes. So here are the, uh, the results we have. The uh, initial program um, was associated with 30% decline in serious crashes. The uh, change, where they, they loosened the definition of speeder, actually saw a slight, it's not nothing, I can't really say it's, it's a certain number, but a slight increase in, uh, in serious crashes at that time. And then when that to the corridor approach, actually, that had a huge effect. They weren't sure where, where the enforcement was going to be. And uh, so we saw a 30% decline in mysterious crash at that point. And so the, the overall effect of the program during this seven years is uh, almost a 40% decline in serious crashes. Which is, that's a big change in crashes. All the other crash studies I've done, I don't know about any of them. How to fix that much. Just coming down on these feeders by uh, using automated enforcement in various ways. And uh, we also saw when we looked at uh, 40 mile hour roads, which were not subject to automated enforcement, that there was not as big a decline in crashes, but there was a decline in crashes. So we're having an effect there as well. People are slowing down not only on the, the residential 35 mile on the roads, but they're also slowing down on 40 mile on the roads. And importantly, they're crashing less, having less serious crashes on these roads. Now, the main question is, uh, why doesn't every community have speed cameras. And uh, one reason for that is uh, people are upset about it. Uh, people seem to think they have a, a right to speed. That uh, speeding is, is, uh, is not, that, not that big a deal. And if you're out there targeting people that are speeding, you're just looking to make money. You're, uh, you're not really trying to make the road safer. We wanted to address that, so uh, in a couple of these studies, we actually asked people uh, what they think of the program, what they think of speeding in general. Um, in Scottsdale, we asked them, is, is speeding a problem on this road? And uh, a lot of people have said, yeah, it, it is a problem here. So I think you should be done about it. Um, do you 
gas department, are you aware of these speed cameras? And, and yeah, we can be quite aware of it. They knew what was going on. Um, and then we asked them, do you think it's a good idea? Are you in favor of having these speed cameras out there? And, and most of them, what's that, 77% said yes. We, we want the speed cameras out there. No, this was a 65 mile an hour road. It's not a residential neighborhood. Still, are in favor of having the speed cameras out there, controlling the uh, speeders that are out there. Uh, we surveyed the uh, folks in Montgomery County, and the other residential areas, and asked them, is speeding a problem? We asked them three times. We asked them before the program started, we asked them just after the program started, and we asked them seven years later. And, uh, not seeing a whole lot of difference in, uh, in the answers here. The, uh, uh, one, one key difference is they think it's being a lot of problem now because this program has been in effect for seven, you know, more than seven, and about ten years. Uh, they are certainly aware of the program. Um, when you go to Montgomery County, people will tell you, be careful. Because there are tons of speed cameras out there, and you're going to get caught. And, and uh, it's uh, somewhere around here, the last item most people have been caught. This, this, is, this is a representative survey of Montgomery County, and the last time we asked them, half the people have gotten camera speeding light citations. They're still in favor of the program. They still like the program. They, they got tickets, but they might have more than one ticket. Um, they also asked them, do you know anybody who got a ticket? And then it goes up to like 90 something percent. They either got a ticket or they know somebody, but they're still in favor of it. They still think it's a good idea. They, they've gotten used to it. They, they've learned to live with it. It's, it's uh, part of making their community safer. On that point, be around for a bit. Um, I said people think they have the right to speed, but uh, when you survey them and ask them, is speeding dangerous? They almost all say, yes, it's, it's a dangerous activity and, and, and it's something you shouldn't do. And then you ask them, do you speed? Do you ever speed? And they, they sort of look down for a minute. And then they come back up and they say, yeah, 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 yeah. And they get a little lock. And uh, there's a disconnect there. They, they, they say it's dangerous, but do they really believe that it's dangerous? It's, they believe it in what they do. Uh, I had a, a reporter a couple of weeks ago that was uh, asking me the same question, and I told her that people will tell you it was dangerous, but they do it anyway. She didn't believe me, so she went out and started interviewing people on the street. And I saw some of the video that she took, and it's exactly that. You go up to those people and you say, this is feeding a problem, this is feeding the age, yes, yes, yes. Uh, do you use feeding age? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know how to change that, so that attitude. Um, she also went a little further in the video, she said, is, is drinking uh, garden fire. And he said, yeah, we have to talk about it. Do you drink and drive? No, no, I don't know how to do that. I don't know if they're telling the truth, but they're not going to do that. Because the, the attitude of the public toward the drinking and driving is very different from uh, the attitude of speeding. People do not see speeding as, as a problem. Going back to one of our slides, more than a quarter of the deaths out there in the last few. So it's a big problem. We have to get people to understand that. And uh, I think I just said it on our own slide here. So speeding is a, a major and persistent problem. And uh, there are a lot of drivers doing it. One way to cut down on that 
is to supplement traditional enforcement with speed cars. Uh, I'm not here to uh, to model anybody to start a uh, a speed camera program. That's not a business. Uh, to have heard of the research. It just shows that it works. Now I'm going to veer off in another direction. There is a lot of uh, organized opposition to uh, to speed cameras, to speed enforcement in general. And I won't mention the organizations that do that, but uh, okay, I'll very vocal about their about their opposition. And uh, so you'll see the, uh, the controversy coming up when uh, a new speed camera program starts or when uh, they look for ways to get rid of existing speed camera programs. And this is not just a U.S. problem. In Arizona, uh, there was a lot of back and forth about speed cameras. Uh, it took a while for Scottsdale to get there. The real program in place after the pilot program ended. Uh, for a while, there was a state program, but uh, depending on the governor, it was either there or not there at various times throughout the history. Um, the last one on there uh, is uh, Ohio. The fight in Ohio is still going on as to whether or not to have speed guns in various cities. Some of the cities want it. State legislators, legislators do not want it, and it goes back and forth. But, they, but they've even had this controversy in other countries. In Great Britain, a few years back, there was a big controversy about whether or not they should allow speed cameras. And they have been for a long time. Um, one of the things that's always brought up is, is that it's an invasion of the privacy. Your brother is watching. You're not in your house. You're, you're out in the public world. And uh, you're just looking at your license plate in most cases, which every other driver on the road can do. So uh, I don't know how to invade your privacy. We're just looking at how you drive. If the police officer was out there, he's watching you as well. So I have to get out of the So um, I went on one of those uh, websites of the, uh, of the opposition and uh, wrote down some of their uh, common criticisms. And, and I want to take some time now to address some of those, uh, maybe even some ammunition when somebody comes back with this sort of complaint. First thing I say is automatic enforcement doesn't change driver behavior. It doesn't do anything. You're just wasting your time out there with those speed cameras. The good drivers are still good drivers, the bad drivers are still bad drivers. Um, and going along with that, they say it doesn't change practice. It doesn't change the behavior. Um, they say there are better ways to reduce violation rates. There's traditional enforcement. Um, there are things like you know, narrowing roads. Speed bumps. You can, you can still keep them down in other ways. You don't need to go with these cameras. One uh, other thing that I'm not quite sure why they say this uh, strict enforcement like this is, is not targeting the real problem. It's just going out to these places with good drivers, the good speeders, not the bad speeders. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure the good speed is on. Um, they say the equipment may not be reliable. These cameras are always breaking. You can't trust these, these very clear pictures that, uh, that are showing you uh, the speed. They say uh, you're not promptly notified, but you have to wait a couple of weeks before we get it taken in the mail. And, and that's, uh, that's just not right. Coming back at you later, they should, they should tell you right away. Maybe you've done something wrong. Um, related to that, they complain that drivers are unaware of these programs, that you're, you're being sneaky, that you're putting those cameras out there 
and you're not telling anybody about it. And then all of a sudden they get these tickets in the mail. They have to deck them. They, uh, well, here's the big one that you see a lot, is that it's all about the money. The only reason you're starting this camera program is because you can make a ton of money. And you can use it for all the budget deficits that you've got. And, uh, don't worry that you're taking it away from this extraordinary, very good driver who just happens to be cute. They say you choose locations so that again you can maximize your profits. So you go to places where you know you can, you can touch these folks. And then uh, this one, I'm not sure what they mean by this, but they just say it, it's just unfair. It's just not fair. It's just it's feeding into the game and, and you're cheating it and breaking the rules by, uh, by using carrots. Let me take this one by one. Um, they say it doesn't change time of the day for the life. I spent a good bit of time earlier showing you that it does change time of the day. We did see people slowing down. We saw the this, this speeders certainly slowing down. It's like 80% reduction in the, in the speeders. They say it doesn't put any crashes. Well, we got the data for that as well. International in the US, we have data showing that we have this rather large reduction in crashes when you put in the speed tether programs. They say uh, there are better methods to uh, enforce speeds, to reduce speeds. And at this point, there are other methods, but uh, they don't solve the problem. The problem is huge. Awful lot of speeders out there. And uh, you can't solve that problem with, with one or two measures. Official enforcement's good. Uh, all this traffic calming sort of uh, things, the engineering measures are good. Uh, but if you've got another thing that you're going to throw into the mix to, uh, to help reduce the problem, Uh, I thought I was getting a third mic right <laughs> You've got other things to reduce the problem and then take advantage of it. So how do they force you to do that? Um, the thing about safe drivers being the ones that are targeted, uh, these people are going at least 11 miles an hour over the speed limit. And so on a 35 mile an hour road, they're, they're going 45. You know, they're still going. They go pretty fast. And I showed you four days pretty fast. Four times even, even faster. And uh, I don't call these safe drivers. Uh, I have a day here. Uh, we have looked at uh, driver records of uh, uh, people who get speeding tickets. And uh, we have more crashes. Uh, we've done that a number of times to identify studies. These are not the safer drivers, these are the drivers that have no crashes. So uh, we are targeting the right people uh, with traditional enforcement and management with the cameras. Targeting the right people. The, the people who are leading to crash uh, Equipment. I don't know a lot about equipment, but I, uh, I do know that uh, those that use the equipment check it all the time. They're always making sure that it works. Uh, their legal department tells them to make sure that these things work. That if you're going to set out a citation, you better be sure that the evidence is uh, irrefutable. And, uh, and they calibrate the equipment periodically. They, they keep it in good shape. Plus, they got to have that clear photos or video in some cases so that they can identify the vehicle, uh, identify the driver in some cases, and uh, to ensure that you're measuring the speed correctly. So, so all of that has to be reliable. The program can never continue. It was shown that, that they didn't have reliable equipment. 
And so I think that's kind of another story. Um, Baltimore, at the time of the DC study, it was like a real site. They didn't have um, speed panels, but they eventually got them, partly because of the experience in, in uh, DC. The Baltimore program at one point ran into program problems because the equipment was not reliable. Because they were giving tickets to people who were not speeders. Uh, the equipment messed up. And that was a huge controversy that, that came up when that happened. Because when everybody started to be they did it in They were trying to maximize their profits. So they have adjusted these things to, to target those who are going to be speeding. I don't know if that's the case. So I doubt that's the case. I think they just didn't take care of their equipment well, check their equipment. And so for a few years, they did not have uh, speed tenants. It's not a recent thing that they just got the program back online. And it is important that, that you have to keep your, have to keep your equipment working. Oh, that's the next one. Uh, prompt notification. Um, if you're actually right about this, you don't get that immediate notification, except for a flash in your eyes when you're passing the camera. But, uh, I'm sure the guy in Scottsdale, he knows what's happening. He saw the flash. He just came up before the flash. So you know what is happening. If you want to come down and they'll talk to you, you know. They know. I just I just got caught, and I'm going to get in that citation in the next week or two. Um, so it's not immediate, but we're trying to get it out there. And good program, and we're trying to get it out there as soon as possible with that citation now. Drivers are uh, complaining with drivers are unaware of these programs. I don't know if they can be aware of these programs. Before you ever start up, you try to get as much publicity as you can. Because you want everybody to know that you're out there. And then in the place you targeted enforcement, they want people to know they're out there. And that's the whole idea of deterrence. You'd rather people change their behavior before they get caught. It is to, it is to make your job easier and also makes the road safer. You want people to know about these programs, to do everything you can to get the word out there, even in some cases with the, with the fixed cameras, they'll even get locations of where they are. They say, This is where the camera is, and we're going to catch you if you speed through here. That's the speed through there. I don't know where they're, what they're doing with this, so not, not paying attention, but to try to get the word out there. Deterrence is the key. You want to change the behavior, not just of those that you're touching, but of everybody. You want everybody to slow down. The money issue. Um, usually the biggest issue that comes up. And again, there have been some uh, big um, mistakes that were made in the, in the media. There was a, uh, an official, or maybe several officials, who, who saw an opportunity to uh, increase the revenues for the locality. And they used the camera program to do that. And it just gave them a real camera program without a name because of what went on there. But in most cases, it's not about the money. And it shouldn't be about the money. And in fact, you should be losing money. If you're doing it right, you should be. This is enforcement. You pay for enforcement. So why shouldn't you pay for automated enforcement? Don't expect it to be a uh, revenue generating uh, endeavor. It should be something where you get to the point that everybody is behaving. You've still got cameras out there just in case. So you're paying for those things, but you're not making any money out. That's a hard sell for a 
just later. Yeah, that's right. It doesn't seem to think I want to do it, and you're going to have to pay for it. Especially when you're in my first album. At the beginning, it's going to make money. You could always have to make money at the beginning. But after a while, I think it's going to lose you. Um, think about locations. Um, in most cases, they choose to use residential areas or uh, school zones because uh, they want to protect the kids, they want to protect the test kids, and they're not going to get their own or their own users. And that's to uh, get the point I have over because people are, are certainly anxious to get out to be enforced in any kind in their neighborhoods. And uh, fairness. Um, again, I didn't understand how they call it unfair. It's, uh, it's just another sort of enforcement. Um, when you get your driver's license, you agree to follow the rules of the road. And uh, if you break that agreement, then you should be subject to some sort of punishment. Yeah, this is just another way of uh, <coughs> determining that you keep broken with your agreement. It's fair. Yeah, and it's, it's uh, actually extremely fair because uh, the camera does not distinguish between different types of people. Anybody who speaks gets targeted by the camera. It's an efficient idea. It's an incentive to the folks that are reviewing these to send out this information. I don't know how you can be more fair than that. You're going to treat it as saying private parents. So that was uh, I think all 10 of the points that I went through. And uh, just uh, an overall, what are the best practices for, for those that are currently running a speed camera program that they want to start the speed camera program? Um, First, include the traditional approaches to control speed and get it out when it works. Uh, remember the, the three E's or the four E's, I guess it is these days, of uh, highway safety. How do you change the behavior or make it grow safer? Uh, keep the public involved, get their support even before you start the program. Uh, let them know what's going on, let them know why you're doing it. Make sure that they, they support you. And otherwise, you're going to run into this business where a where, uh, new governor comes in and, and says, I don't like this program. Well, it's, it's going to be hard for him to get rid of it. It's going to be hard for him to get rid of it if everybody loves the program. So keep the public involved and supportive. Um, it's always nice if you can, if you can connect the speed program to our longer term goal. The beginning of days is uh, vision zero, trying to cut down the number of deaths to zero and the number of crashes to zero. Uh, it's going to be a big component of that. We saw speeding is about a lot of these serious crashes. If you can cut down the speeding, you're on your way to cut down the crashes. Changing driver attitudes. Just the way you change behavior. That one, uh, put it on here because it's the best practice. I'm not sure if that's happened to you. Uh, again, it's, it's people who know that speeding is wrong. Um, they don't think it's all that wrong. And, uh, and that's why they still do it. They don't see it as the problem that we in the city see it as. And uh, how do we change that behavior? Um, Sure. It's not a new problem. It's been around for many years. Same as alcohol is still a problem. You know, we have to change it somewhat, and it's still, still uh, it's, it's less of a, uh, not an accepted effect anymore. But we still see a lot of drinking driving. Speeding is an accepted practice, and that's a thing change, that it shouldn't be acceptable anymore. Uh, always begin your uh, 
program or two programs in one period. And again, that's just to make people aware of it. There's a terrorist as much as they're to get in. I want people to know this thing out there. Um, focus on, on blatant violators. Um, don't say, uh, target those that are going to be passed in our government. Then there definitely is the public support. Or from those that we know to be dangerous. Be transparent. We already said this a couple of times, but don't hide the program. Don't hide just that it's out there, but don't hide how you go about it, where your locations are. Many of them are out there doing the enforcement. How do you you work the system, how do you evaluate the photos or the uh, video, and uh, how do you enforce it, how do you send out the citations? You have to be very transparent about the development. Even the number of citations that you issue, you can put that out to the public as well. You really know just how the program is working. Revenue. If you do have surplus revenue, and you do at the beginning, Use it for safety programs. Um, Mark was talking about the, the revenue from uh, the 24 7 program. And then he was checking into the 24 7 program because you don't want it to be thought of as uh, the revenue generator that you use in it to kind of other budget interests. And uh, show that this works. Keep it in data. On um, speeding behavior, on um, crashes. And so, you're reducing the number of speeders with this program, you're reducing the number of crashes with this program. And in the long term, you keep on doing that. Show that your program is working. Keep on showing that it works. That's the key to the public support. It's just hard to justify ending a program that's having a huge safety. So in summary, uh, one of the questions, how many enforcement works? Uh, you just need to show that it works. If you want to have a program that uh, is supported by the public, uh, keep the community involved. Uh, be clear about what you're doing, uh, what the goals are, and how the program is run, and uh, prove that it's what you're going to need. And like that, I don't know how long I've gone, but uh, I think I'm done. So I will take questions. Is that make it sense? When they um, they have this picture, sometimes speeders are risk takers in other ways too. They may not wear seatbelts. You may see them on the phone or texting or doing something else. Is any of that data also put into the system as, or when they are sent their ticket, there's also a notice saying, you know, you, you broke the seatbelt law, or you notice you were texting and driving, that kind of stuff, or is, it, is there any no. follow through on the other items that they may also be doing? No, in the programs I've seen, Speeding violation is, is just the one thing. They don't use cameras to detect seatbelt use or uh, weeding that's, that uh, may indicate drink driving. They don't use cameras for that. Yeah. And, and usually that's because the, the state has very strict rules for when you can use speed cameras, how you can use speed cameras. They're trying to avoid the controversy again by. by being very precise on, on what to do. First, a comment and a question. The comment is um, your last piece about how people say it's unfair kind of made me laugh. Uh, recently, I'm hearing that about three or four times a day from my one year old. So, uh... <laughs> yeah, yeah, people are like kids. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the question is uh, when you looked at crash data, were you able to pull out specifically? Uh, 
Did the change in crashes involving vulnerable users, and if so, was there a disproportionate change in a greater reduction in serious or fatal crashes involving vulnerable users? The answer to that is no, um, because Montgomery County, although it is pretty big, it's got more than a million people, um, there are still not so many crashes, and, and there are not so many uh, pedestrian crashes that we have enough data to break that out. So it's our fruition. Um, and we're always looking for bigger cities where we can do studies, and hopefully we'll get into those, those subgroups of, of road users. <laughs> there was a, a pretty big range in the effectiveness and the reduction in the number of speeders from, I think, 14% to 65%. And in Europe, I think the, the, um, the range was even bigger. So I'm wondering, you know, where are these more effective and where are they less effective and why? Wow, that's, that's, that's a good question. The, uh, the range is usually um, in these European studies and, and uh, programs, I think, are, are just different there. The types of roads, where they use them, um, whether they use fixed cameras or uh, the uh, mobile cameras. Um, some programs are very small. Even after years and years, they still only have maybe a few of them out there. And so you see less of an effect there, certainly with the crashes. You're going to see lots of that effect. Uh, our three studies that I gave you there actually had pretty consistent results, which, which makes me feel good. Uh, but um, yeah, you're right. There is a range of results that we've seen in studies around the world. And I can't say exactly what the reason is, but, uh, but these programs, especially things like Montgomery County and, uh, and D.C., where they, where they run the program pretty much the same way, um, we see consistent results. Um, I was wondering what the percentage was of um, road users' speed, because I saw the percent reduction, but it would be interesting to see how many drivers were going the speed limit of the overall user population. What was the question? You want to go on? <laughs> um, I was just wondering what the percentage of the drivers who use the road speed. So you talked about oh, okay. reduction. I was wondering what the percentage was. Well, the, the initial percentage, before period, that is just drivers on the road that are speeding before there's any program. Uh, so, like in Montgomery County, it was, it was 30 percent that were speeding. And so, it's a representative sample of, of drivers on the road in the county. 30 percent of them were speeding, and we brought this down to what did I say, two percent, something like that. So, so if you think of Montgomery County as being representative, say, of, of suburban areas around the country. And, and that's what we're seeing. That's at any point in time, about a, a third of us are out there going more than 10 miles an hour on the speed limit. I won't say that's true in Vermont, because they haven't driven in Vermont in quite a while. Um, but in a lot of places it is. Uh, just maybe a comment or two. Um, I think everybody in this room, if they stopped anywhere on the way to this conference, and then came here, has been on camera twice. So the big brother thing kind of wears away pretty quickly in this day and age. Uh, the other thing I would say is, uh, in where I live, Waterbury, there's all these parents and groups that put up signs, drive like your child lives here. So I think in certain environments, people would really welcome the camera technology, whereas on the interstate, maybe not so much. Do you find culturally that people are more accepting in a residential neighborhood? Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, I, uh, when we were doing the study in D.C., I was actually out in the field sometimes um, monitoring the cameras. And uh, these were residential neighborhoods, and, and people would come out. And uh, first of all, they'd ask me, what am I doing there? You know, standing out on their street, this strange guy. And 
and, uh, and I tell them, and they say, well, oh, that's, that's a great idea. And, uh, when you go back and you talk to the, the officials in the district, tell them, I want a speed camera here. We've got speeders coming through our neighborhood all the time. This, this one location is on a hill, and he said, people just go crazy down that hill. If we could have a speed camera, it'd be the greatest thing. They, they love it. That's what I've always heard from anybody. That they, they want, they certainly want their neighborhoods to be safer. They want to cut down on speeders. I want to go back to Jason's question about uh, crash data. And, and you had it kind of as you were summarizing, too, sort of saying we need to get the crash data that shows these things are effective. And, and really, statistically speaking, fortunately, crashes are very rare events in the system. And, and I don't think we're ever going to get statistically robust crash data reductions demonstrated to be attributable to any one of the multifaceted things we need to do in an alliance like this. So I, I guess, uh, Charles, I just wondered sort of if, if you if you kind of just misspeak in the sense of saying we need to get the crash data, or do you honestly hold out hope that there's somewhere where there's even more driving and crashes in Montgomery County where it would be possible to statistically show that and attribute it to a specific factor because it seems to me it's impossible and we as a community need to start communicating that, that, that we, we're not going to see crash reductions, that speed reductions is a very, very good outcome metric and we should use it. Yeah, um, I, I will say I hope to, to see the data background as a statistician, so I'm always hoping to see more data, and yes, crashes are rare, and in small communities, you could go for a long, long time and, and not have enough crashes to, to show statistical significance to someone, um, but I still think you gather the data and present the data. It's, it's part of being uh, very transparent about your program, of what's going on there. And it may lead to, um, every now and then we see a blip where there's an increase in crashes. Uh, these past few years we've had increases in crashes nationwide. Uh, a lot of it has to do with just people are driving more. Um, you will get these uh, opposition groups latching on to those data and saying, aha, this is, this is leading to an increase. And then you got to argue. I, I argue all the time with these folks. You don't avoid it. You don't try to hide it. You have to be transparent and, and you explain to the general public in the best way you can that uh, we are having an event. And, and, and yes, it's good to see speeding and, and just show what's going on with speeding. Be out there every now and then taking the speeding measures and, and showing we've cut down on speeders because that's more of an immediate thing. Actually, it takes a while to accumulate. But I, but I won't. I won't say don't. Don't look at it because and don't publish it because uh, you have to show what's happening. We're done. Just the transparency. I'll tell you, we're out of time. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Charles Farmer, ladies and gentlemen, appreciate you taking the time to be with us today.